Hello there. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Oddly, your mouth wasn't moving. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm only wearing one sock. I can't find my other sock. So I don't know how this interview is going to go with just one sock. But we're going to try and get through it. <laughs> How's that? Good point. I, Good point. I, I hope we can make it. My God. I know. It's really crazy feeling. Nevertheless, you're a little frozen there, Dr. Rosensweet. Well, hopefully it'll unglue. Well, you look good. So we can have you there frozen for a minute in time. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Is that okay? Please, yes. Okie dokie. Good questions we have and good morning. I'm going to wave my hand to our people coming up. Question number one. We have many ways of testing, and we well know the way that you love to test, and that would be the 24-hour urine test. However, the question is coming in, why is it that all of the tests are so different from one another? Um, I know that you are 100% 24-hour, bar none, but many of us test via blood serum levels, and this is very confusing. To me, her, <laughs> and you're not frozen anymore. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how to clarify this, and I don't think I can. Okay. And I think here's the real job. Menopause medicine is very unusual in the world of medicine. There's so few physicians and nurse practitioners who are specializing in it. True. You go into the world of neurologists or orthopedic surgeons or internal medicine doctors or endocrinologists or diabetes specialists, and the list goes on and on. These folks have medical school internship, two to three to four to five year residency, fellowship. These specialties are profound. And when, someone, and when someone does a residency, they are mentored. They're seeing so many patients, they can hardly keep their nose above water. <laughs> and they get to review those patients with senior residency staff and with staff members. These are experienced doctors. This path has been, has been written in stone for ages and ages. I, I went to medical school in the 1960s. This way of training and mentoring physicians was already deeply established and I come to respect it. This wheel has been invented and you go into the world of menopause and you don't see any of that. Zero. No, I know, we know. And it, and it's there's not zero because we in the menopause method have been doing it for 15 years. We have been training and mentoring physicians and nurse practitioners and prescribing compounded founding pharmacists and PAs, how to specialize in menopause, but they're very rare. When you get people who have broad-based practices and menopause and hormones is a small part of what they're doing, I find that when I meet up with these folks, they haven't heard about the 24-hour urine hormone test. They're doing what they're used to doing, serum testing, which works really well for thousands of tests in medicine, thousands. And when you're testing a young woman, providing you can catch her at, at a regular period, which is not that very useful, you can assess her hormone levels. But women with regular periods don't show up very often. They're not going to doctors. They got irregular stuff, so it's tough even to get proper hormone testing on them through serum. So you find, I find physicians and nurse practitioner knowing what they know and they're testing by serum 
and they've been subject to this major marketing thing called salivary testing and urine five-point testing. Now, interestingly enough, traditional medicine, the American College of Gynecologists, the North American Menopause Society, not that I hold them to be the authority on menopause, I certainly do not, absolutely do not. I, 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 I hold the American College of Gynecology to have wonderful, amazing contributions to medicine on the whole planet. God, they saved me, they backed me up with obstetric emergencies, with surgery emergencies. Oh man, they're a miracle when you need them, but not in menopause. But even they have written white papers for years, meaning they have written on their website directions and standards of care as they see it. And they say, don't do serum testing. They say, don't do salivary testing. And there's reasons why they say that. And I agree with them. Not on women you're treating. There's this issue called pharmacokinetics. When did someone take their last dose? There's right. this issue called, can you assess the metabolites? Can you assess estriol and estradiol and, the, and, and four or five of the metabolites, which relate to really important issues in menopause? You can't afford it. These are thousands of dollars for a test that you can get on 24-hour urine that is the proper way to do it that costs less than $300. You can't do it because of pharmacokinetics. So I know this question comes up almost every single time. And and all I can say is find yourself someone who loves treating women in menopause and who takes it on 100%. And what are you going to find? Sooner or later, they find their way to 24-hour urines. We're working with a gynecologist in Texas. Nice. She contacted me a couple of years ago. She's treating, she's really interested in treating women in menopause. She's a major player. She's part of our coalition. And a couple of years ago, she contacted me. She was curious about what we were doing. And I mentioned to her the 24 hour urine hormone test. Well, this is a very inquisitive physician. They're out there. <laughs> They're really out there. They want to do the right thing. She started doing 24-hour urine hormone testing, and I've never seen such a frequent flyer. She's been doing it for years now. Kind of blew her mind, huh? Blew her mind, but it it's her mind. Correct. She gets it. She gets it. She wants to practice the best excellent medicine she can find her way to, and she gets the major advantages. So I don't know how to keep explaining it i wish i i don't know if i can share my screen and show you some of it but here's the deal women your job is this you need to find someone who practices excellent menopause medicine who really knows what they're doing and my own suggestion is get someone who's specializing in it and if you do at the level of 95% likelihood, they are going to have gravitated to the 24-hour urine. And they may have drifted away for a while only to find themselves back in the 24-hour urine. Because right now, it's the very best thing. And it's a learning curve. You don't get to, you know, you want to you test fast and glucose by blood, you're going to become an expert within uh, 50 tests. You're going to get your you're going to get your mind around it. You're going to get you're still going to have to see a lot of test results before you get a feeling for reference ranges and who correlates with what. But that's your job. I say it over and over again. Find go out and find these someone that you really trust, and someone who's experienced and someone who's dived deeply into the knowledge base. And the high likelihood is they're going to be twenty four hour urine. So I know I haven't given you a lot and part of the reasons i don't like to give you reasons is i would have to attack the other methods and right I, that's do not that. my style i don't like to attack someone else's business no. i just want to make the case 
from what I see. So that's what I have to say about 24 years. And, you know, come up you with more. Gonna be a and I'll, I'll, come, I'll try and come up with, uh, uh, with uh, more specific answers related to testing. Um, this particular question actually comes from a really neat lady that is in my school, actually. I don't know where she is. There are so many. And it's this question is part of like a four part question that I'm going to ask over the next interviews. And so we'll get more into it um, uh, later. But it's a good answer that you give. I respect very much that you don't want to attack anyone else's business. That's, you know, I mean, who wants to do that? That's not nice. I want to say good morning to Krishna and our Facebook users and say hello and good morning and thank you for being here. Hi, Manon. Um, okay, second question. And yes, test don't guess. I agree with that, Krishna. Very, very much I do. Um, this lovely word that you like. I am Sir Menno. <laughs> that is our way of saying we are in surgical menopause. Um, I am Sir Menno. I've been taking, I believe, 0 0.1 microgram patch, not able to tolerate progesterone at all. Um, and I could not get rid of my middle of the night hot flashes. Fine during the day, but at nighttime, forget it. I increased my E, but this only made it work. My blood test, blood test revealed low estrogen. So I did an experiment and I left my 0.75 microgram patch on for five days and I felt better. Now I'm completely confused. Is it possible that without my progesterone, my E possibly gets way too high and I need to find some sort of balance? Nobody else can answer this for me. Do you think you can? <laughs> well, I think I can. <laughs> <laughs> There's I good, know you can. There's a good question. <laughs> yeah, we'll explore that. <laughs> <laughs> well, first off, I'd like to say what an unusual deal we're involved in. But it's here you, fun. Here you have a woman trying to figure out her own thing. Yes. Reminds me of when I took interest in automobiles. <laughs> I was a teenager and I got interested in trying to figure it out. In fact, by the age of 28, I rebuilt my first engine. It was a Corvair engine. And by God, I it worked for 7,000 miles, at which point it froze up. And that was the end of it. It's unfortunate that some that a woman has to go figure it out for herself. And yet, good job. You're 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 getting there. I mean, best case scenario. Once I once that engine froze, I realized, oh boy, I'm going to take all my automobiles from that point on. At that point on, I was thirty. Now I'm not thirty. <laughs> <laughs> and ever since, I any town I've lived in, I try and find the very best mechanic that I possibly can. I drive my car in there. I say, please fix it. And when I come back to pick up my car and the mechanic starts to explain it to me, I say, listen, I did, I did the brilliant thing as far as auto mechanics did. I found you. You know what you're doing. You don't have to tell me anything. I can just, the only thing I need to say to you is thank you. <laughs> now that's, that's my answer A. Here's answer B. <laughs> that's your alpha answer? That's my alpha answer. Here's it. my beta answer. Here's your beta answer. You're figuring it out. I would never start with the 0 0.1 pass, the strongest one that's made. Right. And uh, I would never use the patch. This is, if, we, if the patch was the only thing we had, hey, I'd use it in a flash. No getting. At least you get estradiol and you can figure it out. And, it's, and to me, it's a step above Premarin. So if the patch was the only tool I had, I'd start with, I would use the patch and celebrate it. 
it's not enough. You also need testosterone. You also need to figure out progesterone. You also need DHEA. But if estradiol was the only thing he had on the planet Earth and the patch was the only delivery system, bravo, go for it. Now, I would never start with the strongest patch of all. I would start with something much less. I would certainly not start start with anything more than 0.05 or 50 micro, microgram patch. I wouldn't start with a 0.1. Because here's the thing about dosage. There's this thing called the therapeutic window. Mm -hmm. And what this means is you don't want to have too little of something. If you do, you're not going to get the effect you want. You're going to stay symptomatic if you have too little. If you fall below, below the therapeutic window, oops, there's this other thing. If you have too much, if you're above the therapeutic window, you're not going to get the result you want. You have to be in pharmacology. You have to be in the therapeutic window. <laughs> now, there's various explanations why this is so. But bottom line is, I think you overshot that therapeutic window with 0 0.1. And lo and behold, you found your way to 0 0.075, 75 micrograms. Good for you. No shocker. If you don't get within the therapeutic window, you're going to get weird. You get nothing but weird. <laughs> so I think what happened is you got nothing but weird. <laughs> Because I'm going to make a guess. I could. T we could uh -huh. have tested you. We could have tested you by the 24-hour urine hormone test when you were on 0 0.1. And my guess is your levels would have been too high. But look at that. You found your way into 0 0.075, and you got and you had some symptom relief. You're in the ballpark. We don't have to test you. Now, and I think it's a therapeutic window issue. I think you 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 came within the therapeutic window. If you want an explanation, this is what I picture: that hormones are about the hormones and the receptor sites. You need both of them. If you have too little hormones, you're not activating sufficient receptor sites, so you don't get the therapeutic effect. Maybe you get a slight improvement, but don't you don't get enough. If you have too much hormones, you over connect to the receptor sites, you flood them, and you don't get the on-off experience. And I think that's what the explanation for therapeutic window is. And it involves involves, look this one up, folks. The chemical theory of mass action. You got too much stuff going on in there. <laughs> but the explanation doesn't matter. Um, I think it's pretty easy to explain what happened, and you found your way into the therapeutic window, and bravo. It may be the final fine-tuning. You're also not using estriol, using per estradiol. That's not copying nature. I highly recommend you get biased, but hey, listen, you're on your way. Now let's talk about progesterone. There are a certain number of women that progesterone presents a major challenge. When you were younger and you were menstruating, you had about 100 times more progesterone than you had estrogen. What? What? Is it possible that nature likes progesterone or that your body liked progesterone? 100 yeah. times more progesterone than you had estrogen, milligram for milligram. So your body knows progesterone. And women who are having trouble with progesterone, we want to sort that out. I must say that there has been two women in my history of treating with women that I could not figure out the progesterone. And there are ways to go further. Sometimes there's specific allergies, even to progesterone itself. But 99% of the time, we can figure out your relationship to progesterone. And there's techniques to do it. You know... Should you not tolerate progesterone in the long run? Hey, listen, we go with what works, what you can tolerate. So if estradiol patch is all you can tolerate, let's celebrate it. And gee willikers, gosh almighty. <laughs> gee willikers.
gee whiz, <laughs> try and get yourself some testosterone too, because in the long haul, that testosterone means so much. All these hormones mean a tremendous amount. These are the most powerful biochemicals in your body. You know, decades and decades and decades ago when, oh, let's say a thousand years ago, let's say decades ago when medicine got real interested in treating women in menopause and came up with horse urine derived estrogens, estrogen was the focus as if it was the only female hormone. Huh? Yeah, not. It's four human female hormones. Testosterone is not a male hormone. It's a female hormone, too. In fact, as women lose their testosterone, 100% of you lose your testosterone, certainly by three years into menopause, 100% lose your testosterone. You do not want that to happen. You want to replenish testosterone just like you want to replenish estrogens. And it's, it's, it's one of the most meaningful things that you can ever do. Why do women wind up in adult diapers and in assisted living facilities and nursing homes? Highest percentage of them, in my estimation, is from loss of testosterone. Yes, estrogen plays a huge role, especially when cognition is involved in that transition from life at home into life in a nurse in an assisted living facility but so does testosterone deficiency. Without testosterone, you lose your muscles. Take a look at your thighs. If you're 60 years old, take a look at your thighs. They're not as, they don't have as much circumference and as much muscle strength. If you're 70, go into a squat and see if you can stand up. If you're 80, see if you can get out of a chair without using your hands or take yourself down on the floor and see how easy it is to get off the floor and compare it to when you were 40. That's from muscle loss. That's from sarcopenia. So, want to prevent sarcopenia? Exercise, absolutely, but you need that testosterone. Yeah, so what am I saying? Estradiol patch, congratulations. You're on your way. And now you're going to refine your program, best case scenario, over time. And you're going to add... Pro- <clears throat> You're going to add testosterone, crucial, critical, absolutely. I had a discussion, as I mentioned before, with one of my esteemed colleagues. In fact, I've interviewed her on our ins and outs of menopause, Dr. Lindsay Berkson. Who is amazing, by the way. Huge shout out to Dr. Lindsay Berkson. Huge shout out to Dr. Lindsay Berkson. Yes. Genius plus fun. Oh, yeah, she's great. And she and I were talking about, we wondered what percentage of women would not be in assisted link facilities and nursing homes were it, were they be taking hormones? And what would happen to Medicare and government funding of medical care were not the burden of having to support women in the most expensive thing that occurs, assisted living and, and nursing homes? If they were merely on hormones, she and I made wild guesses as to what the percentages of women were able to stay at home. So this is big deal stuff. It is big deal stuff. And um, I want people to know that, you know, we do our interviews, but there's a whole ticking, 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 you know, thing going on behind the scenes really trying to help women in menopause, you know, just get the help that they need. A lot of work is going into this with a lot of love and a lot of passion. So we salute you for, hey, listen, you're figuring it out. You you had a, a, a failure with a 0.1, but look at that. You took the 0.075 and you're getting better. Keep on the path. You got more to do. You want to you want to add testosterone. Hopefully, someday you'll add bias rather than estradiol. You'll discover, hey, look at this! You could be getting your estrogen and organic oils. That's quite an improvement. You'd be getting bias, and you want to figure out progesterone. It's figure outable, and you want to add DHEA too, no more than fifteen milligrams orally. And then you also probably want to figure out your thyroid. And if you do this, 
you're going to have some po power biochemicals and it takes you know I, I i i apologize for the whole medical profession that you have to figure it out yourself but you don't you can well. find, you can find your way to people who are starting to specialize this find us become a menopause method member we are training specialists that's our whole mission we are training and mentoring physicians, nurse practitioners, and, and compounding pharmacists that prescribe, and also physician's assistants to specialize in this. Another short answer from Dr. Rosenzweig. It's the quick quack answer, or the quack quick answer. Hmm. Neither, 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 neither. I don't agree with quack, but I, and I don't agree with quick either. I was neither. <laughs> I was neither quick nor quack. No, you weren't. And never are you. But you know what? Your words are wise. But you yeah. know what you and I want to do? Mm. We want to keep on getting towards click and clack. So we must be on our way to just mention the words quick and quack. Now we've got some we've got some traveling to do to make it to click and clack. Oh yeah, the masters of this please continue <laughs> i will indeed so um this is i don't think that this is this is a huge one but it's an interesting one do we need to take progesterone on an empty stomach or do we need to take it on a full stomach and these, are, all, these are always that's a good question these are always discoveries and it always comes down to individualization. Number one, fantastic congratulations that you're getting into progesterone. Yeah, huh? Go you guys. Oh my God. There are so many women that have benefited by progesterone. It's just outrageous. And here you're talking about oral uh, progesterone. We always 100% start women on topical progesterone, but there's a certain number of women that we definitely switch to the oral, especially when the special sleep advantage of progesterone is needed. Now, when do we want to take progesterone? Well, we want to get the dose right, and we want to get the timing right. So progesterone orally can have this tremendous advantage to support women at sleep. And you need enough dosage. So you wouldn't want to take it at noon, especially if you have a busy day. If you get the dosage right, you're going to go to sleep. No, the optimal time to take oral progesterone is just prior to sleep. So you well, eaten. <laughs> the older you get, you're not going to want to be eating at sleep time. And as a matter of fact, many folks, as we grow older, we want to eat pretty early so that when we <laughs> lie down, <laughs> we're not lying down on a full stomach. Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. So practically speaking, most women are taking progesterone just prior to sleep time, they ate a couple hours earlier and they do just fabulous. Theoretically, since progesterone is fat soluble and it's delivered when you deliver it by capsule, it's in an oil capsule. Maybe you need digestive power to digest the oil. So that's why your question theoretically is a good one. Mm. But I'll tell you, I have never run into a woman who needs to take progesterone with a meal. Got it. That stuff somehow is getting in there and doing great stuff. So the short answer is you don't have to eat it with a meal. Now I understand why you'd ask the question, do you really need to take progesterone, which is only fat soluble at a time when you can digest fats, when, when like let's say with a fatty meal, there's good theory to your question, but man, women are absorbing this progesterone at, uh, at sleep time and they haven't eaten for a couple hours and they're doing great. Now, would the day come where I would have to advise a woman to uh, take her progesterone at dinner time because that would be the only way she could digest it and absorb it? Well, I haven't run into that in 25 years. Mm -hmm. So I love the theory of your question, but I say, be fearless. Take it at sleep time, even if you haven't eaten for three hours. 
you'll be, you'll do great. Women absorb oral progesterone beautifully and get the beautiful effect. And around oral progesterone, figure out your right dose. I mean, what we do is we give a, a, a woman two different bottles of oral progesterone capsules. One of them is 50 milligram capsules, and the other one is 25 milligram capsules. Some women, we have them start at 50 milligrams a night and see what happens. And if that's not enough to support them in sleep and reduce the anxiety, we, we give them a 25 milligram capsule too. So that adds up to 75 milligrams. And if they feel better, but that's not enough, we'll take them up to 100 milligrams. See how they do there. And if that's not enough, we'll take them up to 125. Because ultimately, the compounding pharmacist can make up whatever you need. They can make 122.5. It's very easy. It's as easy of them to make and charge the same for 113 milligrams as it is 150 or 200. Same thing. So we're pretty specific about trying to find the right dose. And I must say that the majority of the women that we work with come in at 75 milligrams, plus or minus. Some come in at 50, some come in at 100. Occasionally we get into 125. You know, some women go higher. The thing is, the basic principle is you we customize it, we individualize it for every single woman. We find your optimal dose. Because, no, it's really amazing, yeah. Because you do not want to be taking too much progesterone because of receptor site interaction progesterone with estrogen if you take too much progesterone you can diminish your effect on mm -hmm. estrogen right you want to get this balance proper it's simple to do when you understand the principle so we see here that someone started at 200 milligrams you know what someone some women need 200 milligrams mm -hmm. i never say never but that's not how we start it I'm not a real fan of Sublingual, not a real fan. Some of your, some of it you're swallowing it. Some of it you're absorbing under your tongue. Well, right. And a a question came in um, that said, for the hundred milligram, do you only really get twenty milligrams after it passes the liver? Well, that's a good point. Yeah. Because no matter how you take any of these hormones, whether it's topical applied to your skin or to your mucous membranes, or oral, what you apply or take, not 100% makes it out to your body, out to your brain, out to your cells. Like when you swallow something like progesterone, it goes from the intestinal tract first to the liver mm -hmm. directly. <clears throat> and the liver is super set up to metabolize it, to take that progesterone and convert it. And this is called first pass through the liver. And a certain highest percentage of what you take orally goes first to the liver and, it, and most of it gets processed. We don't know exactly how much woman to woman, but 10%, 20%, makes it through to the whole body without getting metabolized first and 80 percent 90 percent 70 percent actually gets metabolized right away and it's not effective 10 percent 20 percent we don't know the exact percent women to women actually makes it through the liver without getting metabolized and makes it to the body practically speaking it doesn't matter well that's good we're just trying to find the right dose Right. It doesn't matter that there's this first pass. Right. It does matter when you're dealing with estrogen orally, which I suggest don't take estrogen orally. Don't take right. estrogen orally. Don't take estrogen orally. Don't take. Oh, oh God. my jaw must have got stuck, Carolyn. <laughs> can, can you can you press the jaw mind button? Yeah, here it is. Bang! Did it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm you're unfrozen. Welcome. You're welcome. I'm unfrozen. I got frozen there. Don't take. Happy estrogen. to help. <laughs> <laughs> um, if it was the only thing you had was oral estrogen, I'd say take it, but don't Eat. take it orally. And uh, but it doesn't matter, progesterone, it's 
perfectly fine orally and it doesn't matter ultimately what the dose works out to be even if you're only absorbing 10 percent of it it doesn't matter with progesterone now even when you apply something topically yeah you apply a certain dose to your skin well how much makes it into your body to circulate to your whole body we don't know that number either but it is not a hundred percent of it but does that need to matter no doesn't matter Eventually, it matters how much makes it into your body. And with progesterone, it doesn't matter whether you take it topically or whether you take it um, orally. It, you're going to find your right dose. So congratulations. Right. And so it's a question came in and says that aren't the liver metabolites of progesterone responsible for the sleep benefits? And that would seem... Well, one of them is. They're, they're, that's a good point. We think that one of the special metabolites, 17 da 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 I forgot its name, is one of the things that contributes to the sleep benefit. Mm -hmm. And let's get practical about it. Let's get out of the scientific clouds. One of the biggest problems that women have when they go into menopause is they get their sleep disturbance. There's many others, weight gain, cognitive decline, low energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But sleep disturbance is one of the big ones. Right. And there's two major components to that sleep disturbance as relate to hormones. One of them is estrogen deficiency. If you're getting a hat flash in the middle of the night and it's waking you up, that's estrogen deficiency. The other one is progesterone deficiency. Progesterone is the great calmer. Meaning if you, when you lose your progesterone, you, you lose your calm and you lose your ability to sleep. So getting down to it, when you go into menopause and you're having sleep issues, make sure you get progesterone and make sure you get estrogen. And don't forget testosterone for other reasons. It all comes down to the same thing. You're over yeah. you what to do. You're over you produce four hormones. You want to replenish those four hormones. You're going to love it for the whole rest of your life. And progesterone can make a major difference for sleep issues and you want to find your right dose. And what we do is we have women jack up that dose until they get too much of progesterone. And what happens when you take too much progesterone at night? You wake up feeling groggy the next morning, like you took an overdose of a sleeping pill. So what do you do? You reduce the dose. You take less until you wake up and you had a good night's sleep, but you don't feel groggy in the morning. And that's how you find your dose, short version Download our book. We describe this in great detail. It's true. And then I always refer people to pages 326 and 327, yeah. which I love. The whole book I love. But those two pages, I just want to tear them out and frame them. <laughs> Except for that you send them anyway when you send the oil. So I don't need to tear up my book. Um, but, yeah, it's all there. And it's really interesting, too, because it enables – a woman, I believe, too, which is really cool. Take her menopause into her own hands via um, uh, titration, you know, raising a little, lowering a little, do, you know. It's just not so much that we want a woman to take menopause into her own hands. What we really want is fabulous, excellent, amazing expert treatment for every single woman yes and i agree it's and so it's the kind of thing that it's a team effort mm -hmm. a certain amount that the woman participates in her dose determination and balance really matters and yet we want you to link up with an expert because this is something you're going to do for your whole life we want you to dial that thing into where your body goes yeah this is me. I love it. And I assert that working with an expert plus doing a certain amount yourself, teaming, I always thought it's a team sport, is going to get you where you want to be. And then it's going to last you for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. Wow. It's something really worth getting right. I can hardly think of anything getting more right. And I do a male version of this i work with male experts and they've got me on several different things including my wonderful testosterone and oil 
You want to get that expert. These things are so powerful and they make such a difference. You want to dial it right on. No, absolutely. And um, uh, a question came up like, you know, what levels of testosterone should one use? And it's very, very hard to say because everybody's totally individual. And I remember. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say testosterone is no different than anything else. Number one, every woman can count a hundred percent on the fact that you're going to lose so much testosterone. You'll never get over it, replenish it by three years from your last period. And these days when we test women, these days when we test women, when they first go into menopause, I'd say 85% of them are too low in testosterone. It doesn't work. You want to start replenishing it right out of the gate. Then it's the same thing. It's a combination of starting low and gradually increasing. If you wind up taking too much testosterone, most women get symptoms of excessive testosterone. They're going to get hair on their chin or their mustache. They're going to get testosterone-ish. They're going to feel like they're walking down the street. They want to pout everybody, you know? It's going to be excessive. <laughs> there are symptoms of excessive testosterone. Plus, when you do the 24-hour urine hormone test, you know exactly where you are. And we know exactly, and we know exactly in, in order to evaluate it, I need testosterone and I need its principal metabolite. So it's like all the rest of the hormones well i shouldn't say that dhea is not reliable as far as able to assess symptoms but testosterone progesterone and estrogen most women we're going to be able to tell what too little is and what too much is simply by the symptoms of insufficiency or excess but bottom line we've got the 24-hour hormone test to ultimately as far as too much and too little is so yeah you want someone who's testosterone, just like they're expert at bias, just like they're expert at progesterone, and just like they're expert at DHEA, and just like they're expert at thyroid. This is who you want to find. Same job. Get out and find someone who really knows what they're doing with this. Yeah, absolutely. And and those doctors do exist. Somebody um, had made a post. It, it, it makes me sad just say, you know, saying, you know, there are no doctors that can help. And I, I have to respectfully disagree. I think that, thank you God to you, your team, your method, and many other doctors too, who do have a passion for menopause. I think a paradigm shift is finally happening, you know, certainly from the day of my mother or my grandmother. <laughs> Ooh, yee, very unpleasant. So, this is gonna, um, we've done well actually. The, um, this is a question asking you to explain this small little subject called estrogen dominance. Small, small little subject. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With a ton of sarcasm. Yeah. Well, you, to you always ask easy questions that I usually answer if I remember correctly in one or two sentences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I don't you usually please? get the one or two sentence answers. Would you, would you please, <laughs> I love would you, would you I'm please, sorry? Would you please define yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a Carolinism. I, I, I do not know how to define that. Maybe oh. ask Carol. <laughs> I don't okay. know. <laughs> I'll ask Carol. Daryl, are you around? What does "nyap" mean? Yeah, that, yeah. Excuse me. Estrogen dominance. In a young woman who's very healthy, there's a wonderful, exquisite balance with all the hormones in her whole body. There's the right amount of estrogens. There's the right amount of progesterone. There's the right amount of testosterone, thyroid, cortisol, the whole nine yards. This is in a healthy young woman. And in a healthy young man, there's the right amount of testosterone, there's the right amount of DHA, there's the right amount of estrogen. In a young man, there's the right amount of thyroid, same for young women, same for young men. Now, I was once commissioned to do a study to find what the reference, normal reference and ranges were on young women. 
was three year study. I interviewed 600 women. We came up with uh, 90 24 hour urines on them because we could only find 90 that were regularly menstruating and relatively healthy enough. And these were nursing students. Oh, so what is healthy? And is there anybody who's relatively healthy? Well, not as common as you'd wish. And what's the kind of thing that um, is in young women, sometimes these hormones are not perfectly balanced. In fact, only one sixth of them were in the reasonable zone of the 600 that we actually interviewed. And what throws hormones out of balance is stress. These ovarian hormones have more than one use. Like you think of estrogen and you think of the health of the breast, the health of the skin, the health of the mind, the health of the uterus, regular menstruation. Oh yes, that's what it does. You think of progesterone, you think the health of the uterus, the health of menstruation, the health of uh, protecting, um, and promoting pregnancy. You think of testosterone, all of its good stuff. However, I want you to expand your thinking because in the event of anybody getting stressed, you think of the vanguard of the stress response use, utilizing recruiting these powerful hormones called adrenaline and cortisol. And that's the vanguard of the biological response to fighting and running from a saber tooth tiger. Oh, yes, it is. But guess what? All these other hormones are recruited as well. Like when you look at the Olympics on TV and you're watching these Olympic um, runners, women runners, or you're looking at these gymnasts, so many of them are not menstruating because their training programs are so stressful and they recruit so much of their estrogens to go down not the female pathway, they go down the stress pathway. So they're no longer menstruating. They've recruited their estrogens and their testosterone to participate in the fight or flight of excessive training. And that throws them into hormonal balance, imbalance. What does hormonal imbalance look like practically? One of the first things that happens is you get too much estrogen floating around and you don't have the amount of progesterone to balance it. Estrogen and progesterone are in exquisite balance. Estrogen stimulates progesterone quiets and oddly enough you can get excessive estrogen thus you get overstimulation because you don't have enough progesterone to balance it these women get overstimulation they get overstimulation of breast glandular tissue which means they get breast tenderness increased breast density fibrocystic breast disease breast pain, breast fullness, excessive. They get overstimulation of the uterus. They get over cramping, over PMS, heavy periods. This is overstimulation by an in, uh, inappropriate balance to the excessive estrogen that they're pumping out from recruiting for the stress response. They get endometriosis from overstimulation uh, by estrogen. There's another way that they can get overstimulation by estrogen. They don't have enough progesterone. Their progesterone starts declining. Ah! Their progesterone can start declining as early and far more rapidly than their estrogen declines. All women, they're putting out their peak amount of all their hormones at the age of 20. What happens after the age of 20, plus or minus? You get into hormonal decline. But here's the mysterious thing. It's not entirely explainable by ordinary means. I don't have the explanation. Progesterone can decline and does decline commonly earlier and deeper than estrogen declines, which means you start getting into imbalance. Instead of having a wonderful progesterone balancing your estrogen, if the progesterone is declining, 
faster and deeper than the estrogen is, you get overstimulation of estrogen. You get into, finally, estrogen dominance. You get domination of estrogen overstimulation and you get breast tenderness, fibrocystic breast disease, uterine cramps, endometriosis, excessive bleeding. That's what estrogen dominance is. You get more estrogen compared to the amount of balancing progesterone than you ought to have. So you get more estrogen symptoms. So you get all that overstimulation without the balancing of progesterone. That's what estrogen dominance is. We go into this in the book that you can download. That is true. And, you know, I had been uh, young. Um, my progesterone completely tanked. I did not know. And I'm wondering, had I been tested, had I known, you know, if I had added in that progesterone, if that would have evened everything out and, you know, who will ever know? Maybe a lot of my life would have gone differently. Um, helping. I want to, I want to interrupt you there. Sure. I think I think this is the most important thing that's been said in this whole program today. What? If young women were able to identify mm -hmm. this decline in progesterone and start taking over-the-counter topical progesterone, the world would change. The planet Earth would change. There'd be so much less gynecological difficulty just to address this one fact. Well, in the early 1980s, there was a medical doctor named John Lee. He picked up on this. He yes. said, God almighty, let's give these young women some progesterone. Let's make it accessible. Let's make it over the counter. If they would start in their early 30s when they're starting to get symptoms of insufficient progesterone and they just apply some progesterone cream to their skin, the world would change. And he did. He got out there, and you, we've had over-the-counter progesterone. I recommend our progesterone and oils, but you can get over-the-counter progesterone in your early 30s. Do it. Carolyn. Oh, I wish I had. This, your, your mention of this is the most important thing we've probably said since you and I have been getting <laughs> interviewed, <laughs> interviewing together, doing our program together. This is the big deal. This it is, is something very big I mean, I think it should be mandatory, like a law. <laughs> you know, I really do. Because for me, I really believe my whole life would have gone differently if I had been dosed with progesterone. You know, in my head, I just thought, oh, geez, for maybe the Ashkenazi gene that I had, and I'm making crazy amounts of estrogen. Well, it wasn't that. It's that my progesterone had gone bye-bye, leaving me. It's one of the most common things that happens. So I'm, I'm just delighted that we're lingering on over-the-counter progesterone for young women. If you pay attention and you're starting to get symptoms of estrogen dominance, because this is what this subject came from, uh -huh. you've got something that you can do. And that might begin your journey of getting your hormones excellent, but you can start it yourself. Read our book. Oh, my happy, God, please. Happy, Healthy Hormones. Yeah. Download the PDF version of it free. <laughs> it's amazing, this book. And young women, get the two over-the-counter progesterone as early as you need it. You're not going to yeah. do any harm. You can't do harm with over-the-counter progesterone. You just can't do harm. That's quite a statement to make medically. You can't do harm? You can't well, do harm with over-the-counter progesterone. I am so incredibly deeply passionate about that particular subject because of what I went through and what I would, you know, learn over the, you know, course of the ouch. Sorry. Of course, <laughs> my cat has very sharp claws. Um, learned over the last 17 years in, in really trying to figure this out. Nobody told me, you know, and I was on my own and I had to be my own doctor for a minute there. And um, I was like, oh my God, if I had taken some progesterone back in the day, wow, you know, I mean, who knows? 
but overstimulation of the uterus is the principal cause of uterine fibroids yes. and excessive bleeding. Yes. Uterine fibroids is the major reason why women get hysterectomies. Yes. Do you really want to have a hysterectomy? No. Avoid it. Oh, my God. No. So you start taking progesterone at the right time, and there'd be so many fibroids and so many hysterectomies that would be avoided entirely. So that's why when you mentioned that, I went, my God, Carolyn, you and I haven't talked about this enough. You know? No. That little, that little question called estrogen dominance, look where it's leading us. No, no, yeah. and I've got it written down, and I know you'll screenshot me. Thank you always for doing that, um, mm -hmm. you know, because we've not been able to get to these questions, but we will as we do. We make our way. Um, we've been able to answer a lot of them, thankfully, and I'm very grateful to all the women that are here um, and men, maybe. Um, Estrogen dominance is a huge subject. Many women don't understand it. Women can be very, very low in estrogen, but still be estrogen dominant, right? Precisely. Right. Because, like, when you think about it, let's look at the 20 year old and her level of estrogen and her level of testosterone. And, her, oh, I, get my, I need my third arm. Let's see. Where, how am I going to get three? Okay, I'm just going to play with two arms because right. that's, that's the only number of arms I seem to be able to muster here. So let's just deal with estrogen and progesterone. A young woman peaks out if she's healthy with a balance of estrogen and progesterone when she's 20. At that point on, they both start declining. And then they really fall off of a cliff when she's in her 40s or 50s. Mm -hmm. But they don't necessarily decline at the same rate. Right. The estrogen can be declining and the progesterone can be declining at a faster rate and deeper. So, yes, the estrogen can be lower, but the progesterone can be proportionally significantly lower. As in none. <laughs> Awesome. So that's why, yeah, and as in none sometimes. And listen, if your periods are not regular, Carolyn, that's such a good point. Thank you. It's Thank such you. a good point. If a if a woman has been regular, she's putting out progesterone. If a woman has been regular and not regular, she goes irregular, you can pretty much count on her progesterone is tanked. Because Absolutely. if she gets irregular, it's unlikely that she's ovulating. And in order to put out any substantial amount of progesterone, you need to ovulate. So if your periods have gotten irregular, you can 100% count on you're not putting on enough progesterone, period. So once again, this is about progesterone. And there's something you can do about it before you find your expert. Go, get that over, go to your health food store and get that over-the-counter progesterone. And start using it. And, um, and let me quickly ask, ask you this. Um, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, uh, it came up. Um, there was a little warning on a progesterone bottle that someone got at a health food store that said, may cause cancer. Wrong. I've never heard that. Wrong. Huh? Wrong. It is wrong. It wrong, is wrong, wrong, wrong. And not yeah. only that, the dose, hormones don't cause cancer. Yeah, I know. And we can... Pick that up at the very next. What, we're on. This is Tuesday. <laughs> yes, this is Tuesday. We're going to be on Thursday. Yes. So hormones don't cause cancer, and right. certainly progesterone and the doses over the counter. You can't even get sick on over the counter progesterone. No, I know. It's very you surprising. You can't even get, can't even get groggy on it unless you're a woman that has the right amount of progesterone. But I don't know how many women there are that have the right amount of progesterone. So, right. you know, what I am sorry to say is once again, Carolyn, I'm on a hard stop. And You're I'm, just a popular guy there, Dr. R. I need to complete for the day. But, hey, we're going to pick it up on uh on thursday we are indeed it's always enjoyable always 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 end up saying the same thing every time love interviewing you been doing it for two years straight and i'm not stopping anytime soon <laughs>
<laughs> That's how I feel about Although it. Although we've gotten a heck of a lot more serious. Yes, absolutely. Or maybe we haven't. We maybe, haven't or what? Maybe we haven't gotten more serious. Well, I don't know. I mean. Well, we don't know. I mean, what do we know? We're just not guessing. a lot. We're just guessing at whether we've gotten more serious. Carolyn, it's always a pleasure and it's fun. And I thank you for my Tuesday and Thursday fun. You get your fun right here. And all of us women get our fun right here with you. So we thank you. We adore you. And all the great information you give. Will you screenshot me these um, questions? I just, I just did, my dear. Thank you so much. So you women will know that I'll be getting with you. Dr. R, have a fabulous day. I talked to Joshua last night. That was great. And big, huge hugs to the entire team, clan, and all of wherever you are. <laughs> and I want you to go give Daryl a hug. I will indeed. All right. Till, till Thursday. Right. Bye -bye. Have a really great day. See you later, everybody. Bye.